Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 13 of the course Applied uh, Seismology for Engineers. In this particular course, we will be continuing the topic of estimating seismic hazard analysis at the site of interest. In earlier lecture, lecture 12, we discussed about deterministic seismic hazard analysis. The primary purpose of determining seismic hazard value at a site of interest is to find out what is the expected level of ground motion which is likely to occur at the site of interest. In last class, we also discussed that primarily two methods are there based on which one can determine the most likely to occur level of ground motions at the site of interest. Then there are two methods, one is deterministic seismic hazard analysis in which we will be targeting on worst scenario earthquake means if there is a site at which some construction is going to happen or the site of interest where one is interested to find out what is the ground motion which should be used in terms of uh, quantification of induced effects or in terms of what is the level of ground motion to be used further for earthquake resistant design of the buildings. So, in order to find out motions which is expected considering all the active faults which are there in and around of your study region or primarily within the seismotectonic map. In addition, we will also take into account on each of these seismic sources, what are the earthquakes which have happened in the past. As, as we discussed in earlier lecture also, that in order to collect information about past earthquakes, number of databases are there, which one can refer to starting with uh, United States Geological Survey, one can go with, then IMD is also there, Indian Meteorological Department and many more existing catalogs are there, based on which one can determine what are the uh, earthquakes which have happened in the past at different different coordinates. Then comparing these coordinates with respect to the fault orientation, fault strike values and the linear features which are available on the ground surface. If we are targeting for linear faults, then we can map each of the past earthquake related to uh, the corresponding fault. So, when we are talking about seismic hazard analysis, most of the time there will not be just one seismic source which will be available in a particular region, but suppose this is a site of interest where I will be interested to find out, I will be interested to find out that this is my site of interest and corresponding to this site and within 500 kilometer radial distance, there can be n number of seismic sources or faults which are present. So, this is I am showing in plan. So, number of seismic sources and even each of them are a different orientation with respect to the site of interest which is potential for a bigger project which is uh, for which we one has to go for site specific hazard analysis. So, when we are talking about these we will be taking all these faults into account similarly 2, 3, 4, 5 and a number of faults 50, 60, 100 faults can be there which are present in and around of your study area. Then we will try to find out what is the past earthquake information on each of these faults, which will help firstly in finding out the rupture characteristics of each of these faults. Secondly, it will also help in determining the seismic activity. If we refer to earlier lecture, lecture 9, lecture 10, we will be able to recollect what is the meaning of seismic activity. Basically, it will try to give us an indication about how frequently different magnitude earthquakes are possible in a particular study area. That can be a linear source, that can be an area source, that can be an entire region or seismic source zone within which you have collected the data and determine the seismic activity parameter. So, when we go for hazard analysis, the first is considering all these faults which are present in the region and each of them are capable of producing earthquake from time to time. Not all the faults will be producing earthquake at the same time. Similarly, there will be some fault which are producing earthquakes very frequently, but of lower magnitude. There might be some fault which are producing very rare an earthquake event, but those are of maybe major to great earthquakes. So, keeping all those uncertainty with respect to the earthquake which have happened in the past, in probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, we will be able to find out what is most likely to occur ground motion parameter at your site of interest when we are discussing about spectral acceleration or peak ground acceleration, then what is the 
most likely to occur ground motion parameter or most likely to occur spectral acceleration at a particular period of interest or most likely to occur peak ground acceleration, peak horizontal acceleration depending upon the site for which you are doing the hazard analysis. If you are doing corresponding to site class A condition, you will get hazard A value corresponding to site class A condition. If you are doing it for outcrop motion or bedrock motion, accordingly the values will be modified. So, all this depends upon where you are determining the probabilistic hazard value depends upon primarily the ground motion selection, the, the ground motion prediction equation which one has used in order to perform seismic hazard analysis. So, in today's class we will be discussing about probabilistic hazard analysis. Unlike deterministic seismic hazard analysis where we had taken into account among all these sites taking the original ground motion prediction equation into account which is the site which based on different distance and magnitude combination because each fault is capable of producing different different magnitude earthquake and considering the length of the fault which is extending maybe hundreds of kilometer there might be some location within the fault which is at closest distance with respect to the site depending upon the position of the site and relative orientation of the fault with respect to the site position. So, th in this particular case if you are talking about this particular fault definitely this particular site will be closest distance. So, in deterministic hazard analysis we were trying to find out what is the worst scenario, what is the maximum ground motion which can happen at a particular site taking into account that each of these faults are producing maximum earthquake and again on each fault this particular maximum earthquake corresponding rupture is going to happen at one particular section of the fault which is located very close to your site of interest. So, if you take into account maximum magnitude and minimum hypocentral distance or epicentral distance or any other definition of distance depending upon the definition of distance which is used by a particular ground motion prediction equation, we will get the value of worst scenario earthquake or worst scenario ground motion at the site of interest from deterministic hazard analysis. In probabilistic hazard analysis, we will deal with the uncertainties which will help us in understanding uh, taking into account that different magnitude earthquakes are possible. If you are talking about fault 4 or fault 3 or fault 5, it is not like every time it will be producing worst scenario earthquake. Sometimes it will be producing 3.5, 4.5, 6, 7.5 magnitude earthquake, but also very rarely it is also producing 8 magnitude earthquake. So, what is the chance that different different magnitude earthquake which are less than 8 are also occurring on fault number 5, fault number 4, 3, 2 like that. Similarly, with respect to fault orientation, not every time the rupture during future earthquake is going to happen very close to your site of interest. Not every time the ground motion will be worse scenario. So, there can be ground motion which are lesser than worse scenario. That means, the most likely to occur ground motion at your site of interest is not the worst scenario, but even the lesser value considering the design life. So, probabilistic hazard analysis will give you relatively uh, more appropriate value not keeping into account the worst scenario, but most likely to occur ground motion at your site of interest considering the faults corresponding seismic activity considering the rupture characteristics all into account. So, as we mentioned in earlier discussions also when we are talking about uh, uh, seismic hazard at a particular site that means, we are talking about the ground motion which are expected at a particular site of interest. So, ground motion means there will be some uh, location where site is located, there is some location where your earthquake epicenter or focus is located. So, this is your focus of the earthquake where actually the energy has been released during a particular earthquake located at certain focal depth beneath the ground surface. We have discussed it, but why I am insisting today on this particular part is we will be interested to find out like because of this particular earthquake event which has happened at one particular focal depth or at certain epicentral distance from my site of interest, I will be interested to find out like corresponding to this, we have taken into consideration the source characteristics, the propagation path characteristics as well as site characteristics generally up to bedrock level or outcrop level both in terms of rocky medium. 
unless we are going for local side effect which generally is not targeted in hazard analysis. So, we can go with uh, performing corresponding uh, based on the hazard value we are getting from here, we can take into account local side effect by performing ground response analysis and the topic of ground response analysis will be discussed in later lectures. So, what will happen over here? At some epicenter distance from your site of interest, you some earthquake has happened. As a result, vibration has been transferred from, from your source considering propagation path and at your engineering rock at the site of interest. Now, collectively, if we go into ground motion prediction equation or synthetic ground motion model, collectively when we are talking about any attenuation relation or any ground motion prediction equation, the source characteristics, the propagation path characteristics and site characteristics at bedrock level are generally by default taken into account while developing a ground motion prediction equation. Further, we can verify, we can look into what is the database which has been used in developing this ground motion prediction equation. So, accordingly we can decide whether it, it uses epicentral distance, it uses hypocentral distance or it uses some other form of distance calculation. Similarly, whether it is using focal depth, whether it is using focal uh, um, uh, fault plane solution or focal mechanism. Similarly, with respect to site, whether it is the selected ground motion prediction equation is only applicable to bedrock condition, it is only applicable to site class A or site class B condition. So, accordingly we can, one can get an idea about out of this entire problem where source is also in, involved propagation path is also involved, site is also involved, what information has been already gone inside while developing a ground motion prediction equation. So, whether we are going with deterministic one or probabilistic one, the level at which we are predicting or we are determining the seismic hazard value is mainly governed by selected GMP or selected ground motion prediction equation or selected attenuation relation. So, collectively based on this we can understand that the ground motion which is responsible for the failure of the building for the collapse is a function of magnitude of the earthquake. High is the magnitude for same epicentral distance you may experience significantly higher ground motion. We can also correlate with respect to the energy release also with respect to the amplitude of vibrations as discussed in earlier lectures. Similarly, source to side distance keeping the magnitude same as the source to side distance reduces the ground motion amplitude will increase. Because now for same energy release from the source, the propagation path will be relatively less if you are reducing the distance between source and the site. So, definitely this will have direct effect on the amplitude of ground motion which is generated at the site of interest. Third one is focal mechanism as we discussed also depending upon the dominating movement happening on a particular uh, uh, fault what is the direction in which the dominating uh, uh, vibration has been continuing and what is, is happening in the perpendicular direction. So, many a times when we are selecting ground motion prediction equation, those equations are also specific to what coefficient one should, should use whenever we are talking about strike slip faulting. Similarly, what coefficient one should use when you are talking about dip slip faulting or when you are talking with normal reverse faulting or oblique faulting. So, corresponding to all those one can pick up ground motion prediction equation at uh, select appropriate coefficient values, so that one can use those ground motion prediction equation. Last part collectively whatever we are discussing in terms of magnitude, source to side distance as well as focal mechanism will go into the database which will be used in developing the ground motion prediction equation. That is the reason in the beginning I told that the selection of site for which you are determining the seismic hazard analysis is solely depend upon the ground motion prediction equation. If you are having more information about the site as discussed in lecture 11, that more information is there related to ground motion prediction equation development, we will get more and more complex functional form of ground motion prediction equation where local site effect, propagation path effect and site and source effect can be modeled, can be taken into consideration while performing a regression analysis and performing uh, developing the ground motion prediction equation. So, controlling factors if you go with this particular definition controlling factors for 
seismic hazard analysis. These include the magnitude of the earthquake, higher is the magnitude, more energy will be released and definitely this will have direct effect on the amplitude of the ground motion. Similarly, with respect to source to side distance, whether you are talking in terms of ground motion, whether you are talking about uh, damage, again damage we, we will also take into account the building classification and the, the way the building has been constructed. So, lot many parameters will come into picture, but as far as direct correlation with respect to ground motion is there, as you increase the source to side distance, the ground motion is going to reduce. Third one is fault mechanism or focal plane uh, uh, focal mechanism, uh, which will also have an effect about the vibration generated in the direction along the rupture and in the perpendicular direction. So, that will also control the ground motion and subsequently that will also be indicating variation in the damage characteristics. So, attenuation relation generally it will also take into account the geometric spreading as we have discussed in um, our lecture related to attenuation relation or ground motion prediction equation that propagation path effect will be taken into account before and after an earthquake, how much is the stress drop that will also be taken into account. The same thing which, which I was mentioning couple of minutes back that more information about source, propagation path and sites are there for a particular region, you can take all those parameter variation into account while developing the ground motion prediction equation. So, stress drop if it is there similarly with respect to frequency content, what is the highest frequency content, what is the corner frequency that will also have an indication about what coefficients are generated while developing a ground motion prediction equation. So, GMPs as we mentioned in lecture 11, these are empirical correlation correlating source propagation path and side parameter directly with respect to the amplitude of ground motion generated at the particular site of interest. Now, coming over to seismic hazard analysis, because we have discussed that there are different earthquakes which are generated along the faults. We have also discussed in earlier lecture that not every time you will be having a complete information about the fault, but whenever there is an information about the fault whether it is you are con considering it as point source, linear source or aerial source corresponding to that particular source which has produced earthquake and now the seismic vibration from the source has started propagating in different direction. It will reach to your site of interest and in seismic hazard analysis, we will try to find out once this motion reaches to a site of interest, what motion amongst so many ground motion which are generated by different different seismic sources should be taken into consideration. So, lecture 12 we discuss about deterministic seismic hazard analysis. Now, deterministic seismic hazard analysis takes into account the worst scenario. That means, whatever faults are there, every fault is undergoing rupture at a distance or at the segment of the fault which is located closest to your site of interest. Similarly, that particular closest distance is capable of producing large scenario earthquake or maximum earthquake. So, we do not consider the possibility that other than the closest segment of the fault which is very close to your site of interest, other sections of the fault may also undergo failure. That means, if you are talking about this is the length of the fault and this section of the fault or this sub fault which is capable of producing earthquake is located very close to a site of interest. What will happen if this will undergo rupture rather than this or this will undergo rupture or this will undergo rupture? I have mentioned earlier that not entire length of the fault will undergo rupture during single earthquake again depending upon the rupture characteristics of regional faults in a particular region which is uh, again separate area to, to explore further. So, in deterministic hazard analysis, we do not basically consider that there is a possibility that rupture or the ground motion which we are taking into consideration based on worst scenario earthquake. Worst scenario earthquake means what is the worst scenario, what is the uh, highest amplitude of ground motion which is possible at the site of interest. Now, certainly there might be some highest magnitude of the earthquake, but we have to be also rational in terms of whether this highest magnitude earthquake is going to be experienced by my building, which itself has a design life of maybe 30, 35, 40 years, 50 years. Because if this worst scenario is not having any possibility to get repeated maybe next 200 years also, definitely 
whatever ground motion parameters I am taking into account, those are over safe design, those are resembling over safe design because the ground motion which I am taking for my building design is having a return period of it is not going to get repeated in next 200 years, but yet I am taking it for the design of my building which itself has a design life of 50 years. So, one can take into um, consideration whether one should go for uh, worst scenario earthquake or we can go with the motion which is most likely to occur at the site of interest or most probable ground motion at your site of interest. So, deterministic hazard analysis does not take into consideration the possibility that this ground motion is going to get repeated during the design life of the structure. This event is assumed very close happening very close to the site of interest. Depending upon the orientation, we can say the closest distance may be over here. If you take another fault which is located like this, definitely the closest distance will be perpendicular where this line which is perpendicular to the fault from a point resembling the site is touching the fault that particular location is resembling the closest distance. So, depending upon the orientation of the fault with respect to the site, the position of closest distance on the fault also changes. As again if you go on this particular site or this particular site that means, there will be significant increase in terms of epicentral distance or hypocentral distance that will not be considered as closest distance. So, closest distance means depending upon the orientation of the fault with respect to extreme ends of the fault and with respect to the position which is falling perpendicular to the fault, one can take a decision which should be the closest distance with respect to the site. Again, whenever earthquake is happening at very close distance, we are also taking that out of maybe 50 earthquake which have happened on this particular fault as indicated by my past earthquake history, I will be taking only the earthquake which was corresponding to highest magnitude. So, if 200 earthquakes are there and majority of them are in the range of 5, 6, 6.5, but even one earthquake was there maybe 50 years back, 60 years back of magnitude 8.5 indicated to happen on this particular fault, I will yet take into account that maximum magnitude of 8.5 to occur on a location which is very close to your site of interest. As a result, because of magnitude is highest, distance is lowest, if we put these minimum parameters in the ground motion prediction equation, we will get the worst scenario. Worst scenario means, there will not be any scenario which is going to be more than this particular scenario. We can take like the maximum magnitude which I just told like based on past earthquake information, but based on earlier discussion we have also seen that whatever past earthquake information indicates maximum magnitude, it may or may not resemble the true potential of the site. So, that means, you can further increase the maximum reported magnitude from the past earthquake catalog to find out the maximum uh, magnitude likely to occur or potentially. Uh, the magnitude which is likely to occur at your site of interest. So, the, region, the results that is the reason the results are highly uneconomical because every time you are preparing for worst scenario without taking into account that whether this worst scenario is actually going to hit my site during its design life which is uh, like my, my structure is going to be at the site for last next 50 years, 60 years. I am not at all bothered whether it is going to get repeated particularly about 8 magnitude 8.5 magnitude earthquake if we talk about the return period of those earthquakes are significantly higher. That means, those earthquakes are not happening on the same fault every 10 years 12 years like that, but still I am taking that it will get repeated during 20 years 30 years taken into account that the seismic activity of the fault is very low. So, all these definitely indicating that the outcomes of deterministic seismic hazard analysis are highly uneconomical. That is the reason one can take those, those uh, design parameters you are getting from deterministic hazard analysis in construction of important structure, where the safety of the structure is of prime importance. C example, nuclear power plants, dams, bridges, where you will see the failure of the dam, failure of the bridge, failure of nuclear power plant can be catastrophic in nature. We cannot withstand, we cannot uh, uh, take chance that such facilities should undergo failure primarily related to nuclear power plant because there will be radiation leak, there will be 
lot of devastations. So, that is why similarly with respect to dams, bridges. So, we can say when we are going with deterministic seismic hazard analysis, we generally take the outcome of deterministic seismic hazard analysis primarily for very important structure where the safety of the structure is prime concern and not the cost involved. So, even if you are if you end up in uh, uh, construction cost may be 2 to 3 times higher than what uh, we should have designed based on most likely to occur ground motion, but still we do not want to take chance with respect to failure of such activities. So, we will go with deterministic hazard analysis or we will go with uh, like ground motion which are having probability of not getting repeated even longer very long duration. So, sometime for this important structure we also get an input from probabilistic hazard analysis, but corresponding to very long return period. So, one can refer to the guidelines available whenever we are using probabilistic hazard analysis particularly for uh, nuclear power plants uh, based seismic uh, hazard evalu evaluation. So, probabilistic hazard analysis as I, as I mentioned each fault is capable of producing different magnitude earthquakes against these different magnitude earthquake will not happen only at the location uh, which is very close to your site. It can happen maybe very far from the site because whenever site is there and your fault is extending like this rupture may happen even at this particular location because rupture is, will not happen with respect to taking the site position into account. Rupture can happen anywhere along the fault. So, deterministic hazard analysis does not take that into account. Probabilistic hazard analysis will take uncertainty that what are the different segments in which rupture can happen in future earthquake. It takes into account with respect to location which I just mentioned. Similarly, with respect to the magnitude of the earthquake. Not every time 8 magnitude earthquake is only going to get repeated, but 6 magnitude earthquake, 5 magnitude earthquake they are also going to get repeated and we also know that higher is the magnitude of the earthquake less frequently that particular earthquake will be happening because corresponding to that particular magnitude the accumulation of strain energy will take really longer time. So, if we talk about 5 magnitude earthquake that might be happening more frequently than on the same fault 7.5, 7.8, 8.2 magnitude earthquake because 8.2 magnitude earthquake will require a relatively large amount of energy with respect to 5, 5.5 magnitude earthquake. So, in probabilistic hazard analysis we will also take into account that even though we are not taking into account the worst scenario, but we are taking into account the scenario which is most likely to occur or which is happening more frequently at your source of interest. So, ground motion again useful for design of routine buildings where not every time you will take decision with respect to the safety, but at also you will be taking into account what is the finance involved what is the ground motion parameter which you are getting based on your hazard analysis. That is the reason the results from probabilistic hazard analysis are quite useful when we are talking about the construction of routine buildings where not only the finance, but also the safety of the buildings are also given equal importance. But certainly in this particular case finance will be giving more weightage than the safety because even the building undergoes partial crack, it undergoes uh, some uh, defaults also, but still the building is able to serve the purpose or we can go for retrofitting of the building rather than 2 times, 3 times, 4 times more money in the construction itself you, you put because that will be very huge amount taking into account, account that the ground motion which based on probabilistic deterministic one you are you are taking into account for construction of the building will not occur, mostly it will not occur with respect to the uh, routine buildings. So, certainly we will not go for deterministic hazard and value for the construction design, design and construction of routine buildings. So, probabilistic hazard analysis was proposed by A. Cornell in 1969, this is the history and then after that there is lot of development with respect to how the estimation of maximum magnitude at a particular fault, the minimum magnitude or cutoff magnitude of a particular fault. Uh, can be taken into consideration, then how accurately one can determine the seismic activity of a particular region that can also be taken into account. Overall, the probabilistic hazard analysis takes into consideration not only single magnitude earthquake, which is corresponding to maximum magnitude, it will take all possible magnitude into account. 
So, if the fault has produced magnitude 4, generally magnitude 4 and above are considered because lesser than 4 magnitude will not have significant effect on your infrastructure as far as hazard analysis is concerned. So, what we will take? We will take all the magnitude. If 4 magnitude is there, 4 magnitude to whatever the maximum potential earthquake which is capable to happen on a particular source, we will take all those magnitude into account and try finding out what is the frequency of different magnitude earthquakes to occur at your seismic source. Similarly, we will not again take into account that the earthquake is going to happen only at the closest distance from the site. It can even happen at intermediate distance, it can even happen at farther distance. So, again we will take into account not only single value of distance, but all the distances, all the locations which are there in a particular fault with respect to site. So, we will take all those location within the fault and then try to finding out what if very close to the site, this is the epicentral distance, what if it is at intermediate distance between the source and the site, what if it is at far farthest distance from the site on your seismic source. So, we will take all those distances, minimum distance to maximum distance and intermediate values also, take all those into account. Similarly, with respect to whenever we are taking all magnitude, all distances, certainly lot, com, lot many combination of magnitude and distance in terms of ground motions. If we take different magnitude, different distance from here and put in your ground motion prediction equation, that means you are talking about infinite or significantly high number of finite seismic scenarios. If we are talking about on one particular fault, 20 magnitude if you are targeting. Similarly, here also we are talking about 20 distances. That means, corresponding to each magnitude, you are considering that this magnitude earthquake can happen at all the 20 locations on the fault. So, collectively we are talking about 400 seismic scenarios at least to take into consideration what is the potential scenarios which are likely to occur from just one single source. And the same procedure will be repeated for all number of seismic sources. So, that means, if you are having a site which is surrounded by close to 60, 70 seismic sources. One can refer to seismic atlas map of the uh, region and then find out what are the active sources. One can also explore past earthquake information into account and try developing the seismotectonic map. So, one is going to give you 60 seismic sources are there. Corresponding to each seismic source, we have taken 20 scenarios corresponding to these uh, 20 magnitude and again all these 20 magnitude on each source is it can happen at any location any 20 location within the fault. So, 20 times 20 times 70 is the number of total scenarios which you will be taking into account rationally in order to find out what is the uh, different combinations of scenario likely to occur at your site of interest. Then we will take into account corresponding to different magnitude, what is the uncertainty or what is the frequency to occur with respect to distance, what is the probability to occur that it may happen at minimum distance, it may happen within this particular distance range, it may happen in other particular distance range. So, we will take that into account and combining all those uncertainties, we will be getting the hazard curves. I will discuss what is hazard curve here in the end. So, PSHA or probabilistic hazard analysis characterizes uncertainties with respect to location, with respect to magnitude and with respect to frequency. How frequently with respect to magnitude and size, magnitude and location, what is the uh, frequency of ground motion to get repeated at your site of interest. And of course, if we have local side effect also into account, that will also have help in understanding the induced effect of the earthquake. So, you will get based on probabilistic hazard analysis not just one scenario, but significantly large set of scenarios. You can take those scenario into account and even go for quantification of induced effects. So, combining all those uncertainty primarily with, re with related to uh, uh, location, secondly with respect to magnitude and thirdly with respect to the frequency of earthquake or amplitude of ground motion with respect to which you are interested to find out whether my scenario based on these two combinations are going to get exceeded or it will remain within the uh, desired value of ground motion parameter. 
So, the steps which one has to follow for probabilistic hazard analysis are these four. Firstly, you will try to find out what are the seismic sources which have or which are capable of producing at least a minimum magnitude of 4. So, corresponding to these sources, we will try to find out what is the frequency of different magnitude earthquake to happen on these particular sources, taking into account the seismic activity of that particular source or if number of earthquake are not significant to find out seismic activity of a particular source, we will take into account the seismic activity of a region and uh, based on that, we based on principle of superposition, we will try to find out what should be the seismic activity of individual source, take into account that the overall seismic activity within the region should be maintained. Primarily, that will be uh, one can determine using how many number of earthquakes in a region are there, how many earthquakes are there on a particular fault. Similarly, what is the length of fault? and what is the summation of length of all the faults in a particular region, because primarily based on these two parameters, one can redistribute the magnitude from magnet, uh, the seismic activity from a region to individual seismic sources. So, we have identified the seismic sources which are there, which are capable of producing magnitude of 4 and above. Based on that, we try finding out the frequency of different magnitude to occur at the site of interest. Similarly, we also try to find out what is the distribution pattern in terms of different hypocentral distance or different epicentral distance at which the earthquake can happen in the uh, I mean different scenario earthquake can possible possibly happen. Based on these two that is magnitude frequency and distance probability distribution for each of these seismic sources is required. After that, we will try to find out based on Gutenberg Richter relation, what is the frequency of different magnitude to get repeated during uh, the ground motion to get repeated during a given exposure period. Considering different magnitude and different distances, we will try to find out different seismic scenarios using ground motion prediction equation. So, step 3 tells about estimate the ground motion which can be produced by different combination of magnitude and distance from each of the step. So, step 1 is going to give you what is the magnitude frequency, what is the distance probability, step 2 is going to tell you overall in a particular region or on a fault what is the frequency of ground motion to get repeated or what is the frequency of different magnitude to get repeated during a particular fault. Step 3 will give you what is the ground motion which is going to be produced considering the seismic scenario of magnitude in step 1 and step 2 and the distance probability in step 1. Collectively based on this, we will try to find out the frequency of different ground motions. Correlating this with respect to the ground motion amplitude, we will be able to find out in step 4 the value of hazard curve. So, hazard curve basically is going to give you a plot of or a correlation between ground motion parameter, ground motion parameter with respect to frequency of occurrence or we can say a return period. That means, if we know for one particular seismic source the hazard value, this hazard value is going to give me like on that particular seismic source, how frequently or how frequently this particular ground motion is capable of happening. That means, if you are talking about some seismic source F 1, we have the hazard curve, based on the hazard curve we can say like corresponding to 0 0.03 g, 0 0.03 g corresponding to this and then we will try to find out based on y axis what is the frequency of 0 0.03 g which can be produced on fault F 1 based on the information which is available to us. So, that is called as hazard curve. We can determine the hazard curve for individual fault and then clubbing up the hazard curve of all the faults. Suppose, 70 faults are there which are active in a particular region or within your seismotectonic map, then you can club the seismic hazard values from all these 
70 seismic sources and then it will give you overall what is the hazard curve for a particular region. Take into consideration all seismic scenarios from all the 70 faults. So, we can have hazard curve for individual fault also, we can have hazard curve for all the fault and summation of all that. Once the hazard curve is known to us, we can refer to the hazard curve and then considering what scenario, this is also going to give you the scenario, seismic scenario which we are targeting. If we are targeting maybe some scenario which is having like 2 percent probability that it is not going to exceed in like 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, correspondingly we can find out the frequency, the lambda value of that particular scenario and based on the total hazard curve corresponding to that frequency, we can find out how much is the ground motion which is having this particular frequency or having this particular scenario frequency to occur. So, that is the advantage of total hazard curve. We can have hazard curve for individual fault. So, and we can also have hazard curve for total faults or summation of hazard curve for of the all the faults which is going to give you the hazard curve at your site of interest taking all the active sources within your seismotectonic province or seismotectonic map. Now, this is we are discussing about n number of seismic scenarios and whenever we are talking about seismic scenarios that means, we will be taking into account the ground motion prediction equation. Based on earlier discussion we have seen this ground motion prediction equation are based on the values of different coefficients which are regression coefficients obtained once we did the we, we had the database of whether it is recorded ground motion or synthetic ground motion. So, we had a database and then once from that particular database we are developing a ground motion prediction equation the coefficient value c 1, c 2, c 3 and so on up to c n the value of these coefficients are a function of period of interest. So, we are going with 0 period that means, whatever value of ground motion parameter we are going to get that will be also called as spectral acceleration at 0 seconds or peak ground acceleration or peak horizontal acceleration. Similarly, we are talking about 0 0.02 seconds or 0 0.1 second corresponding to 0 0.1 second pick up the value of seismic coefficients or uh, the GMP coefficients put in the equation corresponding to different values of magnitude and distance again put in the equation. So, what you will get is spectral acceleration corresponding to 0 0.1 second or 0 0.2 second like corresponding to what value of period we have taken the value of the coefficients. In the end once we are getting the ground motion parameter that will be corresponding to that period alone. So, repeating the same procedure which we have shown over here again we will be getting different different values of hazard curve. So, we may get if we are taking uh, the coefficient values corresponding to 0 second and perform hazard analysis like this in the end we will be getting a total hazard curve for a particular site of interest because if you move your site of interest the distance values will change with respect to seismic sources. So, the total hazard curve is also dependent on the site location where you have actually derived the total hazard curve. So, one is the site location. Secondly, when you are determining the ground motion parameter, our ground motion parameter is also a function of the time period of interest. So, the total hazard curve if you are developing considering coefficient value corresponding to 0 second, definitely such hazard curve you can be you can use to predict ground motion for a given frequency at 0 second only. You cannot use single hazard curve to determine the uh, ground motion for any frequency of interest and any period of interest. So, there are basically two frequency one is the frequency of ground motion and second one is corresponding to this period which is again corresponding to the period of motion we can find out different different values of hazard curve. So, two values of frequency we will be using one is frequency how frequently the ground motion is going to get repeated at the site and secondly corresponding to 0 second, 0 0.2 second, 0 0.6 second what is the value of the coefficients and what is the corresponding spectral acceleration. So, one period is corresponding to spectral acceleration other period is corresponding to the 1 by frequency of ground motion uh, the frequency of seismic scenario to get repeated during the uh, period of interest. 
So, collectively you are having four uh, steps, one you characterize the seismic source, then try finding out magnitude uh, frequency, second distance probability, club magnitude frequency and distance probability with respect to the frequency of ground motion and determine the total hazard curve. Once total hazard curve is there for uh, a particular region or a particular site, then depending upon the seismic scenario of interest, one can go and determine the value of ground motion parameter. So, for a particular period of interest, the frequency of seismic scenario can change and corresponding to that one can determine the ground motion parameter even with respect to single total hazard curve. But if you are changing your period of interest that spectral acceleration corresponding period, definitely you have to have corresponding to the period of interest the total hazard curve then only you will be able to determine the value of spectral acceleration corresponding to that period. Repeat the same procedure, we will get the uniform hazard spectra. That means, corresponding to 0 period for known frequency of accidents, we will try finding out how much is the spectral acceleration. For same frequency corresponding to hazard of 0.2 second, again we will repeat the same procedure, you will get again uh, uh, spectral acceleration corresponding to 0.2 second again corresponding to 0.8 second, 1 second, 1.5 second, 2 seconds, repeat the same thing. Every time based on the hazard curve, what value you are getting, it is going to give you one more point on your uniform hazard spectra. So, uniform hazard spectra very much similar to response spectra, but it is corresponding to uniform hazard. Same scenario, we are talking about some seismic scenario which, which has 10 percent probability of accidents in 50 years, then this 10 percent probability in 50 years will be applicable to all the points which are shown on your hazard, uh, uh, yeah, hazard spectra. That is why it is called a uniform hazard spectra. So, uniform hazard spectra again it will change with respect to the frequency of interest. If I am talking about uniform hazard spectra corresponding to 2 percent probability in 50 years, then all the points in your uniform hazard spectra will be indicating what is the spectral acceleration corresponding to 2 percent probability in 50 years at 0.1 second, 0.2 second, 0.6 second like that. If we are talking about uniform spectra, hazard spectra corresponding to 1 second, again the entire plot will change. So, that will give you corresponding to 1 second, what is the uh, corresponding to uh, known value of frequency like uh, 2 percent probability in 50 years, then all the points in uniform hazard spectra will be indicating the spectral acceleration corresponding to 0 second, 0.1 second, 0.2 second, 0.5 seconds but each of these points corresponding seismic scenario will be having the frequency of 2 percent of not exceeding in uh, of uh, 2 percent probability in next 50 years. So, that is how we, we take the seismic scenario into account and utilize your total hazard curve in terms of determining the uh, probabilistic seismic hazard values. So, these are the steps which we have already discussed earlier. Uh, we have discussed this also that uh, seismotectonic map will take into account the geological data, geophysical information, past uh, seismic data also, then we will also take into account the seismic uh, source information also and then accordingly we can find out, uh, the, we can develop the seismotectonic map of a particular region. Again depending upon your site, we can take into consideration a radial distance within which we have to find out more information about geological and seismological properties of a particular site or a particular region of interest. So, one can refer to these uh, guidelines which are given over here in order to find out like up to what detail one has to collect information in terms of geotechnical, geophysical, geological, seismological data for a particular region of interest. Now, as you mentioned summary. So, uh, we will be discussing about frequency of uh, distance probability, then we will be discussing about frequency magnitude and then collectively based on this, we can say we are interested to find out what is the probability that ground motion at my site of interest is going to get exceeded another ground motion. So, if I say what is the probability my ground motion is going to exceed 0 0.5 g, then this is 0 0.5 g, which is going to come 0 0.5 g will come over here and 0.5 g should not increase or should increase 
because of a seismic scenario which is generated corresponding to magnitude m star and corresponding to distance r star. That means, I have taken into consideration a number of scenarios and then collectively I am interested to find out what is the probability that corresponding to these scenarios my ground motion is going to exceed a threshold. I am defining a threshold value of 0 0.01 g. What is the probability that it is going to exceed 0 0.01 g? What is the probability it is going to exceed 0 0.05 g? Accordingly, every time I am getting how frequently 0 0.01 g or 0 0.05 g is capable to be get repeated at my site of interest. And this thing we will correlate with respect to the Poisson model which will suggest that the probability the same probability which is given over here it is a function of 1 minus exponential minus lambda t. So, lambda is going to give me the frequency how frequently I am interested to target for a particular seismic scenario. So, if I am interested to find out a ground motion which has having 10 percent probability of exceedance in next 50 years that means, whatever ground motion I am going to predict today that has only 10 percent probability it is going to exceed 90 percent chances are there this ground motion is not going to exceed in next 50 years. Similarly, another terminology which is very uh, uh, frequently referred in probabilistic hazard analysis what is the ground motion which is having 2 percent probability in 50 years. That means, I have to determine a ground motion based on probabilistic hazard analysis which will have only 2 percent probability to exceed in next 50 years. So, if today I am going to give the ground motion from today for next 50 years this ground motion which I have generated by which I have determined based on probabilistic hazard analysis today for next 50 years there are only 2 percent chances that this ground motion may exceed 98 percent chances are there that whatever ground motion I am predicting now it is not going to exceed. So, this is the frequency of ground motion or seismic scenario. This seismic scenario, this seismic scenario, and it is not going to get exceeded during the design life. So, T is referring to design life or period of interest. So, if I am saying it is not going to increase in next 50 years, that small t is the 50 years. So, T is the period of interest. When I say 2 percent probability of exceedance, that means this is probability is 2 percent that my ground motion in next 50 years are not going to get exceeded. So, corresponding to this value of 2 percent corresponding to lambda value um, small t value of 50 years one can determine that what should be the frequency of that ground motion which has just 2 percent probability of exceeding in next 50 years 98 percent chances are there that motion will not going to get exceeded in next 50 years. So, one is based on this particular equation we will try to correlate the probability with respect to the magnitude and distance scenarios and based on the second we will also correlate this with respect to the frequency of ground motion in a definite period of exposure which is generally considered as the design life of the structure. So, depending upon the position of your site with respect to the distance we can take into account different uh, definition of distances when you are talking about dipping fault, when you are talking about vertical faults. So, there are different uh, uh, methodology which, which have been mentioned over here. Overall, we are interested to find out even if you are taking into account a two dimensional source, what is the probability that earthquake rupture may happen over here, it may happen over here or any other particular location. Because not every time earthquake will happen at the same location, but that particular location of rupture. So, you can say this is the location of rupture, rupture location. So, this will be taken into consideration while determining the hazard and uh, uh, hypocentral distance uncertainty. Similarly, you see this particular site, this is your site of interest and I am interested to find out the distance probability. So, what I will do? I will draw maybe number of circles and then corresponding to the location which are there between each concentric circle. Now, I will try to find out what is the probability that in the future rupture is going to happen in this particular section. What is the probability rupture will happen over here? What is the probability rupture will happen over here? What is the probability rupture will happen in this particular site? Accordingly, we can find out Remember, we are trying to find out rupture probability here, 
but corresponding to this particular section which if undergoes failure my hypocentral distance will be this distance. If rupture is going to get repeated over here this will be my hypocentral distance which I will use in my ground motion prediction equation. So, we can go with maybe dividing the entire fault into sub faults and try determining based on the coordinate of these sub faults what is the distance and corresponding to each distance what is the uh, location which is undergoing rupture. Similarly, with respect to linear source this is what I was just mentioning you can divide the entire fault into number of sub faults and try determining corresponding to each sub fault what is this hypocentral distance range and try determining the probability. If you are talking about two dimensional source or aerial source rather than dividing the length into different different uh, sections we can divide the entire area into different different parts. So, if we recollect what has been discussed in uh, uh, source characterization we have also got point source linear source aerial source. So, that also can be done over here. So, this is already discussed in lecture 9 I am not going to those details over here aerial source also is there. So, we have earthquake catalog which is homogenized declustered completeness analysis also done seismic parameters are also determined then minimum magnitude and maximum magnitude have also been determined. Based on this we can find out the distance probability. You can see distance probability that rupture can happen anywhere. So, Curie Gamma and Eng in 1977 gave the these equations based on which you can find out what is the probability that rupture can happen at a distance r which is user defined. So, you can see in this particular uh, uh, figure that if you extend like this we will be able to find out what is the minimum epicentral distance and then what is the starting point distance and any particular distance capital R a small r which one has to take into consideration r is the rupture de, rupture width. So, every time whenever you are taking r value into account this is a length which is available to rupture and accordingly we can find out using these two equations. So, first one is telling what is the probability that rupture can happen at an, any distance other than r other than r means anything lesser than r means you are talking about location which is outside the fault rupture cannot happen outside the fault. So, certainly that is 0. Similarly, what is the probability that rupture can happen anywhere between uh, like here where the maximum distance of r is small r. So, you can say that particular probability will be equals to 100 percent. So, that means anywhere this is going to give you the cumulative probability. So, based on this you can find out what is the frequency we will try to find out corresponding to any particular point starting from the start of the fault to the point of observation what is the cumulative frequency. If you divide the fault into number of sub faults then we will firstly try to find out cumulative probability and then reducing the contribution from just previous sub fault we can find out what is the actual probability with respect to the fault to undergo rupture. Okay, so, based on this calculation we can find out typically corresponding to distance what is the probability density function. Similarly, with respect to magnitude as we discussed magnitude is not going to get same, but it keeps on changing uh, different magnitude are possible on single fault. So, we have to also find out what is the magnitude to occur. So, based on again this equation which is going to give you what is the seismic scenario based on seismotectonic map we can find out b value is again alpha beta we have used in seismic activity parameter we can also determine corresponding to beta the value of b m i is minimum magnitude of interest m u is the upper magnitude and on a particular fault and m i is any magnitude for which we are interested to find out how frequently that magnitude is going to get repeated during the uh, I mean, uh, over a period of time and that is how you can find out the magnitude frequency of accidents. Uncertainty, so now we have distance, we have magnitude and we have set of scenarios on which distance, magnitude and uh, hypocentral combination can happen. So, then we can find out what is the probability that corresponding to magnitude m i happening at distance r j the scenario which a GMP will be predicting 
it will exceed a threshold value which is user defined. So, I am design deciding a value of maybe 0 0.05 g, then this equation is going to give me the probability that my scenario which is corresponding to magnitude m i happening at r j will exceed 0 0.05 g, what is the probability. So, this is uh, this is where the, the ground motion prediction equation will come into picture. Now, here we see the probability of ground motion to exceed is also a function of 1 minus exponential minus lambda t. This is the frequency of seismic scenario, this is the period of exposure t and this particular part is also equal to the probability that ground motion because of n number of capital N is number of faults and on each fault the magnitude is varying from lowest magnitude of m naught to maximum magnitude of m u and, and, and on each fault the distance is ranging from r i to r j or r minimum to r maximum. So, given by Richter relation we have already discussed, I am not going to these details, we have already discussed this in lecture. Now, this is one thing which is quite important here when we are discussing about Poisson model because generally the probabilistic hazard analysis follows Poisson model that means that is that was given as equals to 1 minus exponential minus lambda t. Now, here just an example it is given I consider an event that occurs on an average once in 1000 years that means the average frequency of that particular event will be 1 over 1000 that is 0 0.001 that is the frequency like, like 0 0.001 times in every year. If I am interested to find out what is the probability of that particular event, so this will be lambda value. We can put over here what is the probability that this event is going to happen at least once in 100 years. So, now t is given as 100 years, lambda is given as 0 0.001 and based on this we can find out. So, the probability that an event which happens at least once in 1000 years has only 9.52 percent probability to happen in next 100 years. Similarly, we can follow this particular part. Generally, as I mentioned, two scenarios will be given 10 percent probability in 50 years. So, we can put 10 percent probability over here as p value in, in 50 years of p, t is given as 50 years, we can find out what will the value of lambda. Lambda value is given over here 0 0.0021, this is the frequency. If I am interested to find out the return period, that means at least once the scenario should be repeated in those many years. 475 years. So, 1 by lambda, 1 by lambda is equals to return period. This is the return period corresponding to 1 by lambda. So, 1 over 0.0021 that is giving to give you 475 years. That means, at least in once at, at least once in 475 years, this seismic scenario is going to get experience at your site of interest. Same if you go with 2 percent probability in 50 years, that means, it is going to give you 0.00 not 404 per year as the frequency or corresponding to a return period of 2475 years. At least once the seismic scenario which you are targeting will be experienced at your site of interest in next 2475 years. So, repeating this particular part, again logic is also quite important. What will happen many a times we will have different source model, we can have linear source model, we can have aerial source model. So, in order to take both into account, we can go with logic tree approach such that the limitation of one model or uh, uh, can be minimized and we can have multiple approaches. Similarly, with respect to seismic uh, activity parameters also we can determine based on different uh, approaches and collectively use all of them such that the effect or the limitation corresponding to one method can be minimized by taking different different methods. Thirdly, with respect to ground motion prediction equation we can go with more number of ground motion prediction equation because each of these equations are empirical one and whenever we are predicting ground motion there might be some standard error. That standard error can be minimized if you take more number of GMPs into account. So, this particular process is called as logic tree approach where you can follow multiple approaches related to seismic source, uh, seismic activity, GMP and many more things into account and club it to find out the spectral acceleration values. So, this is a typical hazard curve as I mentioned this is the hazard curve given for different different periods of interest. Depending upon the this period I have taken into consideration what is the coefficient in GMP, 
perform the seismic hazard analysis, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, the value I will get. Same way, I can repeat the same process, I will get different values of uh, hazard curve for different locations. We can also get the deaggregation part, which is basically the plot of how much contribution different magnitude and distance combinations are giving at a site of interest, which is given over here. So, this can help in finding out if there is important fault, you can find out what particular magnitude on that particular fault can be considered as the worst scenario for my site of interest. And this is the uniform hazard spectra. So, I have taken this from Kumari 12 2013, the reference is given in the next slide. So, thank you all, this is for uh, probabilistic hazard analysis. Thank you.